Welcome to this very special edition of the Pace Report. I'm Brian Pace, reporting live here at Sony Hall here in New York City. In a career spanning some 50 years, this year marks the 50th anniversary of soul and rock legends Coolin' the Gang. And tonight here at Sony Hall, Coolin' the Gang is going to be performing many of the hits, ranging from Jungle Boogie to Who's Gonna Take the Weight to Celebration, Ladies' Night, the list goes on and on. Now, in a career spanning 50 years, this group has sold over 80 million records. They've had 25 top 10 R&B hits, and they've had nine top 10 hits. And they've had 31 gold and platinum albums. Tonight, I had the chance to sit down and break bread with the co-founding member of Cool in the Gang, Mr. Robert Cool Bell. Now, as you might know, the Bell brothers were one of the founders of the group, and they were born in Youngstown, Ohio, but they grew up over the bridge in a city called Jersey City, New Jersey. I had a chance to sit down and break bread with Mr. Bell to reflect on what's kept this group together, why they're so important to the idiom of rock and jazz and soul, as well as talk about some of his very important bass influences. Over the bridge is, is Jersey, and this is where you you back home. Right. Your love was really by the bass, by way of playing drums on paint cans. Yeah, that uh, was an interesting story. That that was back in Youngstown, Ohio. See, uh, we were born, my brother and I, in Youngstown, Ohio, and we moved to Jersey. City uh, in 1960. And then, of course, we met uh, the first original members in 1964. But there used to be this little area not too far from my grandmother's house. And uh, it was a school called Immaculate School. I think it was a Catholic school. And, uh, but it set up over like a little valley going down into the hood. <laughs> and we used to take these paint cans and Depending on how much paint was left in the bottom of the can uh, is what tones you got out of it. So we found that quite interesting. It was like bongos, you know. And uh, of course, when we finally left the paint cans and came to Jersey City, and that's when we met some of the other members and started getting to the jazz side. The first thing we called ourselves was the Jazz Yaks, then the Soul Town Band, and then Cool in the Flames. And then cool in the gang. Now, we our first love was jazz. You know, listening to um, Miles Davis, Freddie Hubbard, uh, Reggie Workman, all those uh, various jazz musicians. More my brother than, than myself, but you know, I listened too. But uh, then we backed up the local talent in Jersey City, and they were part of an organization called the Soul Town Review. Now, Soul Town Review was trying to be like the Motown Review, but Motown was much more su successful. So anyway, we would have to um, learn these songs. There's about 10 to 15 artists, you know, per show. Maybe we do it every other week or sometime every other month. So we became the Soul Town Band. But now we had to learn these songs, you know, the uh, uh, Beauty on the Skin Deeps and the... Uh, Smokey Robinson and all that stuff. And then we listened to James Brown, so we put a little cold sweat in it. And that's how our sound started to develop because of the jazz and then the R&B and then the funk with uh, James Brown because we called ourselves Cool and the Flames at one time, too. Uh, the famous James Brown, the famous Flames. And James Brown said, uh -uh, we, we didn't want to have any problems with the Godfather. <laughs> so we changed the name to Cool and That's how we became Cool in the Gang. It was cool in the flame for maybe about three or four months, and that was over. So anyway. You know, it was interesting. In, in, in your generation, you had AM radio, and AM radio was really a hybrid of top 40 jazz and pop and R&B. And, you know, there was two very important things that were happening musically. There was Motown, and then there was also Stax. And there were two important bass players that came out of, one out of Detroit and one out of 
of Memphis. There was Donald Duck Dunn for Stax, and wow. then there was James Jamerson in Detroit, and he had a very big influence on you musically. Yeah, yeah, James. I mean, all those songs. He was playing bass for all those tracks that was coming out of uh, Motown. So, and then, like I said, we were backing up these bands of these local talent. So I had to learn the bass line. You know, I didn't learn the complete bass line. I cut, did it my way, but still at all, he was a great influence. What was it about James Jameson and his technique that because he influenced a lot of people. And then I'm going to talk about some of the other bases that you influenced down the road also. What was it about James Jameson that brought a whole nother dynamic to the electric bass? Well, I would say his, his style, the, the way he played. It's his style and uh, those various rhythms uh, with uh, some of those stuff like what the Jacksons was doing. I mean... Uh, those tracks was was moving. It was a lot of part to, to those tracks, you know, and um, so I mean, pretty much the style, yeah. The the horns and the bass lines, the the signature sound of Cool and the Gang. When did you know that the formula was really gonna? About what year did you know that the formula was gonna stick? I would say um, mid seventies. Uh, when uh, we came up with Jungle Boogie, Hollywood Swinging, and Funky Stuff. Did you think with the change of folk music and then R&B, which evolved into funk, you had said something about Sly Stone. And they say Sly Stone recorded the very first funk record. There's a riot going on. Rhythmically, were all the bands having to go in that direction because soul music pretty much was fading out to R&B? In the Sly direction? Yeah. Um. I would say so. I mean, not all the bands, but uh, Sly definitely had a, a great influence on what was going on at that time. And uh, he was like a pop, rock, R&B band because <laughs> he had that sort of that rock thing going on and Sly's, you know, Sly's whole thing at that time, you know. And uh, some of those bass lines was, uh, was, was killer. Uh, Larry Graham. You know, <laughs> you know, I said, wow, I just had some nice stuff there. One of the big things that happened in the 70s, there was kind of a, a, a musical style that kind of put the brakes on funk 
and R&B and it was disco. And I, I'm, I'm, I hate that people kind of put a, a black eye on disco because I think Gamble and Huff made some very important soul records that were of the, the disco genre. And I believe that you guys recorded one of the biggest records, Open Sesame, which I, I believe is one of the, the, the best disco records that came out at the time. Were you opposed to recording something like that? Or was it time for you to kind of give in to what was commercially it sound at that time? Well, um, at that time with the various uh, disco groups, we uh, we felt that we we had to do something, you know, danceable for the dance floor. But at the same time, we didn't want to make it that just straight up disco. So when you listen to Open Sesame, my brother, he took the straight disco beat, and then he put the Open Sesame Cool and the Gang horns on top of that which if you take the, the beat and you swing it, then you got, yeah, you know what I'm saying? Or, you know. So that's how we wanted to keep our identity, I guess keep our identity when we did that. Were there a lot of fans that were opposed to you doing that when you did that record? I think there might have been. I mean, you know, because uh, uh, you know you're doing uh, disco, but we didn't, we call it dance music. It makes music for people to dance off. Yeah. You know, I don't know who he came up with the disco title, but you know. You know, I have to ask you. You know, your music has been in some of the most iconic movies in history. We're talking. We're talking Rocky. We're talking about Saturday Night Fever, which your song Open Sesame was on the, sound, yeah, on the soundtrack. Yeah, right. And also, I, I love this movie. I still get something new every time I watch it, Pulp Fiction. Oh, yeah, it was Jungle Boogie, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think about it now? It, it opened up Pandora's box for you musically, but it also opened up another generation of music fans who were never exposed to Cool in the Gang. Yeah, uh, we were told that uh, Quentin Tarantino was a fan of Cool and the Gang. And because uh, his movie was kind of out there. <laughs> but uh, to use our song in the movie, it was, it was great. I mean, he was definitely into what we were doing. That's kind of validation on your whole career. You know, the, the nail in the coffin plus this Rock and Roll Hall of Fame nomination that we're going to try to work on getting you. Yeah, we're going to try to get it. I mean... Um, Three years ago, four years might have been now, we did 42 shows with Van Halen. We did 10 shows with Kid Rock. We opened up for the Dave Matthew Band. We've worked with Rod Stewart. We've worked with Elton John. I mean, you know, and people would, ah, especially the Van Halen tour. People were saying, well, how's that gonna work? So David Lee Roth said, hey, it's my vision, it's gonna work. He saw us play at the Glastonbury Music Festival in London. And that week you had Coldplay and U2, 90% you know, rock, you know. And uh, I don't know if he was in the audience or he was watching us on the BBC. But he called up Eddie and, uh, and Alec and said, listen, I got the perfect act that I want to come out and join us. Because they brought him back for a celebration a reunion celebration tour because, you know, he had left and Sammy Hagar and all the whole thing about what was going on with them. So he told him, see, yeah, that's what I want. So I said, man, you're crazy. He said, man, that's what I want. So we went to rehearsal in L.A. And uh, he comes to my, into the dress room and he said, listen, he said that 60% of my audience are ladies. He said that in the 80s, you guys had celebration and we had jump. And then he says, when we were coming up in L.A., in the clubs, Whiskey of Go-Go's and all those clubs in L.A., we used to play funky stuff and Hollywood swing. So I didn't know any of that. I, I didn't really know Van Halen that well, you know. 
But when he said that, um, he knew exactly what he was talking about because when we opened up the first show with them and uh, we had a couple sort of AOR uh, album oriented songs like Misled and uh, and we had uh, Emergency, you know. That was a big record for you guys yeah. in the 80s. Yeah, yeah. So we started off a little bit, we started off with Fresh and then we went into a little bit of um, I saw the songs that had a slight rock edge to it. But it wasn't until we got to Ladies Night, Get Down On It, a celebration. That's when the crowd was, first of all, they said, they did that? They did this? They did that? And, it, you know, it's like the ladies were saying, especially when we hit them with Ladies Night, you know, the ladies get up. Because that's, that's their party. That's their anthem. And then we hit them, we get down on it. It was like whoever was with them, a uh, 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 stone, you know, uh, uh, rocket, she would look, turn around and said, hey, you better get down on it. You came in <laughs> here with me. You know, get your butt up. Let's party. Right. And by the time we got the celebration, we had them. So I think David Lee Roth kind of knew that, you know, because he fought for us to be on the tour with him. I was just getting a little concerned because in the, in, in the press, we were blowing them out. I said, wait a minute, don't say that. We want to stay on the tour. They <laughs> cool the guy who blew up the, uh, 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 Van Halen out. But it was, all, it was all good. I'm just saying we've done so many different types of things and fit in different type of genres. You know. Now, 1973 was a very important year for Cool and the Gang because you guys recorded an album that really put you – really on the pop charts, because you needed a hit, I understand, when you recorded the album Wild and Peaceful. Yeah. What was very important about this record moving forward? Well, Wild and Peaceful came about uh, with some pressure from the record company. At that time, we didn't have uh, big hits. We had, like, the territorial hits, yeah. Philadelphia, Connecticut, maybe get far as Richmond, Virginia, North Carolina. Songs like Funky Man, Funky Granny, Good Times on My Mind, all that kind of stuff that we were experimenting with and having fun doing. So it was a big record at that time, Soul Macusa by Mongo de Mongo, or the Mango. And uh, our record company came to us, she said, listen, you guys, uh, you need a hit, <laughs> and so many words. And we got this producer who uh, just uh, came off this big record with uh, Soul Goose. And we met the guy once, and no, we weren't feeling him. So we, we told the record company, listen, we're going into the studio and cut some tracks. Well, we went into the studio, a place called Baggies, in, uh, in the village in uh, New York. We went in there around 8 o'clock in the morning, and all we did was jam all the way up to midnight. When we finished, we had created funky stuff, Hollywood swinging, and Jungle Boogie, wow. all in that night. Wow. So maybe you can say our backs was up against the wall. <laughs> but the re no more problems from the record company, and that created that wild and peaceful album. But on the other side, for our love for jazz, we created Wild and Peaceful. That song was uh, nine minutes long. Yeah. And it was like, you know, almost like in the Middle East and Africa. And we had that had that vibe going on, you know, like don't mess with us no more vibe. <laughs> and that's how, it, that's how it came about. You know what also helped that record out too? There was the advent of FM radio. And FM radio really went against the grain. And there were really a lot of urban DJs and even pop DJs that played the whole entire songs, not the edited version. You mean a wild and peaceful? Yeah. Yeah. What did you think about FM radio? Did it help you guys out a lot during the 70s? I would say so. Yeah. I mean, when they got into, like, what you just said, they, they uh, diversify and play a song like Wild and Peaceful or Summer Madness. Or Summer Madness Live, if we did it again, right. the second version of Summer Madness. Right. Yeah, and there were some songs, I guess some of my fans might pick up uh, 
Uh, I remember John Coltrane. That's another song we did. Some Burl Sam, yeah. which was that mixture of that whole uh, yeah. Charles Lloyd vibe, yeah. you know. So those were like album cuts. So people would gravitate towards the hits, but we had a lot of stuff in those albums that real gang heads would come to. Oh, God, you remember this song? Can you play that? I said, we ain't played that in years, man. <laughs> you know, the next album... You was with Summer Madness. And that album, you guys used a lot of synthesizers on that record. Tell me the, the, the inception of how you came up with Summer Madness, because that record now is an, on all institutions of smooth jazz, soul, and even some of the jazz stations play it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Summer Madness was um, part of a song called uh, You Don't Have to Change. And... Uh, as we were uh, doing the song, my brother had just got that Moog synthesizer. So he was listening to the song. He said, that's two songs in one. So he took the vamp, of You Don't Have to Change, and stayed up all night, and he just soloed on the vamp. And that vamp created Summer Madness. We said, well, what are we going to call it? I don't know. He said, let's call it Summer Madness. Like in the summertime, it was hot down there. <laughs> it just happens. Sometimes songs like for us just came. And we wouldn't even have a title for it, like the song NT. Mm. A lot of rappers sampled that drum beat on NT. The reason how it became NT, because we didn't have a title. So what are we going to call it? No, no title. title. <laughs> <laughs> NT. Chocolate butter. People said, what the hell is chocolate butter milk? We don't know. It sounds good. <laughs> Where were you and what were you doing when you found out that Summer Badness was a hit? Well, I think it happened in Chicago. I'm trying to think of the big Rodney, uh, I don't know. E. Rodney Jones? Yeah. WVON? Yeah. He uh, was playing Spirit of the Boogie. And that time, that was the time we have A-side, B-side. Summer Madden was on the B-side. So he flipped the record. He said, let me play this other side and see what happens. And the phone started ringing and people started saying, well, who is that? He said, I guess he played a little guessing game. Well, well who do you think it is? It would say, uh, 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 Herbie Hancock or uh, Donald Byrd or one of the, uh, those jazz fusion artists at the time. And that's what took off. So I had to, you know, take my hat off to the rod and he turned that record over.
Demir Diodato. Mm -hmm. Everybody who doesn't know who he is, he was really and still is a dynamic arranger. In fact, he was the staff arranger and keyboardist for Creed Taylor back in, in the late 60s and early 70s. And there was a period where Cool and the Gang had to revamp and rechange their style. And you guys hired Diodato to produce some very important records that put you guys in a very different stratosphere. Yeah, um, Diodato came, came around uh, during the time uh, when we were recording at uh, the House of Music in West Orange. Now, we had been out on the road with the Jacksons at that time, Jackson 5, because Michael was there. And uh, Dick Griffey, who also uh, uh, started Solar Records and Shalomar and all of them, he said, listen, you guys, he said, you're doing your thing, you know, we're happy to have you on the tour. But he said, you know what you guys need? We said, what, Dick? He said, you need to get a lead singer. And we said... Hmm. We thought about it, and some of our music melodically opened the door for somebody to sing lead over it. And the first place we went to, we uh, was working at the House of Music, and Diodato was there. And other people come through, Meatloaf, a couple of rock guys. And uh, uh, our manager at the time, Val Hackett, I don't know if you know that name, but Val... Val knew uh, uh, the people around JT. JT was uh, with a local group called Soul Filet, I believe. And uh, so we had somebody that we want you to listen to. We said, okay. So JT came into the studio, and my brother started playing some different changes. He said, sing this, sing that, sing this. And then he went to more uh, jazz, uh, progressive, changes and uh james he had lived through it and he told james you know you, you sound like a young nat king cole or somebody <laughs> said, well nat king cole yeah <laughs> but anyway that's how it started and so the first record was ladies night now ladies night came about because my wife and i uh, we were hanging out in New York, so we would go to Studio 54, regimes, all that spot, and we realized that every Friday night of the weekend there was a ladies' night. So I came back to the guys, man. I said, I got a great idea for a song. They said, What? It's a ladies' night. They said, Yeah, this one of those everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how it came about. So, dear Dollar, we all got together and we started to create. Ladies Night. Didn't know it was going to become the record that it became. And Frankie Crocker broke the record in New York. And it kind of moved the horns away. It moved the, the classic, the, 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 the instrumental horn sound, and y'all went more. And your bass lines got a little more funkier on, on going into the 80s with, without the horn. Well, what Dio Dowell said, listen, um, you got to make room for your singer. And I would say, well, what do you mean make room for the singer? So you got to open those tracks up and take some of those horn lines out. That's what I meant. And, uh, and he kind of knew what he was trying to do because uh, the horn player was saying, man, we, we, this is cool in the gang, man. We play what we play. He said, yeah, but listen to me. Open up the track, back off the horns a little bit so that you, cause you're introducing somebody new. And he was right. He knew exactly what he was doing. And you know another band that was did the same thing you did, and you guys were hitting neck and neck also. The Commodores did that also. Oh, the Commodores were definitely pop. <laughs> yeah. They because yeah. they because a lot of people don't realize this. They had the, the funky style. The, back, right? Yeah, they started off as a funk band, yeah, I know. and then. The late 70s, I guess, the crossover. Everybody had to have a pop hit and an R&B hit. Mm -hmm. I noticed that Cool and the Gang and the Commodores were kind of neck and neck in the sense that they got rid of a lot of the horn, but there was more vocal involved. Yeah, that's what happened uh, when we brought JT to the band. JT was with you guys for until when? About 10 years. He came in 78 and left in around 88. 
And what was the reason for, for him leaving the group? Well, I mean, he wanted um, to venture out. He wanted to do uh, other things. Um, he wanted to write different kind of music that that he wanted to write. And uh, and then he had some problems with our management. So you know, he decided to go ahead and go, go on his own. So we allowed him to do that. Brother, what has been the collaborative process between you guys over the years? How does one bring one idea to the table and then elaborate on that idea? Or one says, no, this idea is not going to work. We're going to have to try it this way. How? How? There's got to be a give and take with this. Oh, it is. You know, I mean, um, my brother uh, style and how he hears things and, of course, being a, a saxophone, saxophonist, you know, he hears a lot of different things, and he likes to maybe overbuild sometimes uh, when he's creating his music. Uh, to me, I'm more of the basic guy, you know. You know I'm, all, I'm out, got my ear to the street, you know, I'm listening to the grooves out there, and the punk band, and that whole thing. But together, the combination worked, he and I. And then you had Charles Smith. He was the one that came up with those wicked guitar yeah. parts. And we kind of figured, how is he doing that? It's like two, two guitar players playing. And Charles, he, he was an amazing guitarist. And he was definitely into West Montgomery. Yeah. He did a lot of the West Montgomery licks you hear what Charles was doing. And Ricky was um, like the funk key keyboardist. Yeah. You know, he would play a whole lot of chords, but when he hit that chord, he laid on it. He would just lay in there. Well, you hear that in, in the beginning of Ladies' Night. Doom, 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 doom. Mm -hmm. I mean, you hear him, and then you interact with that, that and then that groove kicks in. Mm -hmm. It's like there, there was a different, different sound with Cool and the Gang in the latter part of the 70s and the 80s than it was diametrically starting off in the late 60s. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah, it became more, more uh, um, what's the word, though? We calmed down on a lot of stuff that we were doing. Again, because now you're talking about JT was in the band, yeah. too. But Ricky wasn't there when JT was there. Ricky had passed on. Right. And he was kind of doing this Northeast, Southwest project. He was out in California doing this thing, you know. But, um, yeah, I mean, but the earlier stuff. And I think a lot of the uh, 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 rappers 
listen to what we were doing in the 70s because we didn't have any lead singers, but we had a whole lot of stuff for an example. You know, they might, oh, I like that drum beat, let me get that snare. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, let me get that bass line, mix it up, throw it with something else. And when you listen to the hip hop, you see like they, why they loved it so much because it was a lot to get. <laughs> like a supermarket, oh man, they're coming out of the album. Let me check it out, man. Oh, I like that part. I'll take this part. I like that part. I'm going to take this part. You know, the technology's changed now. You can go in your room and record parts and send it to your, your, your other band members. Do you like the new recording technology or do you prefer to go back into the studio and cut different parts and edit? I mean, it's just so, the, the process is so different. You guys were dealing analog and now we're all digital. Yeah, well, um, I guess dealing with digital, you can get a lot of things done quicker, you know, and just taking parts. And, and uh, unlike the old days when you want a part, you got to take the, the whole razor blade and cut that tape, try to tape back together. Oh, we we'll take this part, put with that part. Take that part, put with this part. You don't have to do that no more with digital. And, you know, so it's all good. Robert Cool Bell, what does soul music mean to you? Soul music is the energy, it's the vibe, it's rhythm when you deal with the motherland. All the various elements and the beats and the chants that you hear in African music. The gospel is one thing, but I'm talking about the other side rhythm. of that, the rhythm, the rhythm side of soul that creates what we have today. I mean, you have the gospel. I take nothing away from gospel. I listen to the gospel every now and then, but I'm talking about that energy, those beats, those grooves. A lot of times my brother would, would say something like the rhythm of the word. If the word is... Uh, what you gonna do? Da 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 da. If you want it, then pa da 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 da. You take the rhythm, the word, and create the rhythm. Now, that was the secret that you know. Not too many people know. My brother talks about it now. It's the rhythm of the word. It's how you walk, how you talk, that energy that creates those grooves that people can relate to. They don't know why they relate to. Oh wow. That's interesting. Maybe it's hypnotic, you know. And coming from Africa, you know, it's a lot of hypnotic, hip, hypnotic energy there. That's soul. Robert, did you ever, in a million years, think that guys like Flea from the Red Hot Chili Peppers and God rest his soul, Bernard Edwards, they they cite you as one of their biggest influences on the bass. Do how, how do you feel? Because both of these guys brought different, a different vernacular to the music. These guys were great. Yeah, Bernard, I knew Bernard, um, of course I know him because uh, of uh, now and uh, the Sheik and that whole Sheik movement. Now was uh, the first cousin to Spike, a trumpet player. They're all family. And, and now uh, he said, hey man, he said, Hollywood Swing, that was a blessing because I, you know, good times came from that. You should really listen, yeah. <laughs> it is similar. So, but another bass player who I uh, really loved his playing, and I was surprised that he looked up to what I was doing, and that was Jaco Pastore. That he played so much stuff. I said, "What?" He looked up to me. I play. I can't play half the shit he played. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it was Jaco Pastore. Jaco was in a world by himself. Yeah, he was. He was. What was the first time you saw him, and what did you think of his technique when you saw him? It was when he was playing with Weather Report. Weather Report. All the stuff he was playing with the uh, uh, Weather Report was uh, ridiculous. Yeah. That'll do it again for this very special edition of the Pace Report. I'm Brian Pace, reporting live here at Sony Hall here in New York City. I'd like to personally congratulate and thank the incomparable Robert Cool Bell for 50 years of keeping this rich tradition of soul music alive with Cool and the Gang. I'd like to personally thank the staff and management here at 
Sony Hall for their warm hospitality. Also, I'd like to give a mad shout out to Mr. Angela Ellaby for arranging my time with Mr. Bell. Make sure you guys go out and support the 50th anniversary tour of Cool and the Gang coming to a city near you. As always, please visit my website, www.thepacereport.com, for my weekly column as well as my past segments. Until next time, remember if it's in the groove, it'll make you move. Till next time, peace.